While we've already defined what crises are, it bears repeating and contextualizing. A crisis can relate to anything from a customer service crisis played out on social media to a major disease outbreak around the world. In this podcast, we're going to get into more detail about what crises are and what they mean. No matter the type of crisis, there are three characteristics that they all share. First, crises are inherently public. If they're not public, they're just an issue or problem to solve. The public nature changes the reality for the organization. Second, sometimes it's easy to get so focused on the organization in crisis that we forget when organizations are trying to manage crises, they're not islands unto themselves. Instead, they're trying to manage these situations in a complex world where the organization might have opponents, supporters, competitors, and different actors all connected to the situation, many of which with a direct interest in it. So these are tricky waters to navigate. Third, no matter what anyone might say, the core stake at risk in a crisis is the relationship between the organization and its stakeholders. This is why crisis communication and even crisis management is typically a core function within the public relations domain. If those relationships aren't managed, the organization is likely to lose them with varying effects on the organization. So how do we begin to think about crisis communication? Throughout this series, we're going to be connecting three topics, risk management, crisis communication, and crisis management. So the rest of this lecture is designed to introduce these to you, and then throughout this series, we'll be getting into more detail. In the field of crisis communication, our work doesn't begin when the crisis emerges in the public eye. In fact, our best work happens when the crisis never emerges. One of the critical shifts in our understanding of crises in the last couple of decades is that we shouldn't be surprised by them. In fact, Heath and Millar argue that crises shouldn't be viewed as unpredictable, just untimely. This means that modern crisis management and communication is as much about risk management as it is about responding to the crises once they emerge. So if we take a look at this process, it gives us a good starting point for how we should be thinking about ensuring that risks to our organizations are mitigated or even removed before they become problems or crises. So let's work through the process from left to right. First, we begin with risk detection, natural starting point. Before an organization can plan to minimize risk, they need to know what they are. Second, the risk has to be evaluated. Here, we're trying to make judgments about the likelihood and severity of the risk to both the organization and its stakeholders. Third is how the organization communicates risk both internally and externally. Now, this is tricky business because technical information doesn't always translate well to lay audiences. Think about all the debates we see over topics like vaccination and climate change where the science is clear, but that may not be well translated to different groups. The communication of risk is also tricky because different people perceive risk differently. For example, I'm very comfortable driving and don't really see it as a risky activity. However, my partner would much rather take mass transit because he sees driving as much more dangerous than taking a bus or riding the train. So the point is that communicating risk is vital to ensure that relevant stakeholders can appropriately understand the situation and be prepared to deal with it. Finally, sharing information allows for the organization and the mobilization of a collective response to hopefully reduce the risk and respond to the danger. This can include a lot of different activities that we'll be addressing throughout this series like issue management, managing the stakeholder relationships, developing communication plans and protocols, as well as staff development. But more than that, it also includes developing teams and decision-making systems that facilitate the process. In the end, what the crisis communication function does in the real world is help organizations manage risk. It's not just a management or a PR function. It's part of ensuring the organization's viability. If we think of crisis management as the material part of crisis response, then it's clear that it's intertwined with risk management and crisis communication. But let's offer a concrete definition of crisis management so that we're clear. It's a process that allows organizations to deal with major problems that pose a threat to the organization or its stakeholders. So if crisis management is this process that allows them 
to deal with major problems, then for organizations, it's also a learned behavior that focuses on the mitigation and control of internal and external dynamics of the crisis itself. The thing is that it's not like being a mechanic that can run a diagnostic to find a problem in a car and fix it. Good crisis management is about managing people, their attitudes, and their decisions. After watching organizations manage crises in the construction industry, an industry that is definitely crisis prone, Lucemore developed a theory of crisis management that identifies both challenges posed by crises, as well as the factors that influence the effectiveness of crisis management. Lucemore's theory argues that crises can create four management challenges. First are power struggles that are likely to emerge during crises. These can occur within an organization as it tries to manage the situation, but they can also emerge externally as well between organizations within the same industry, companies and NGOs or governments, and so on for a host of reasons ranging from who's responsible to who will get credit for acting. So if we understand where the particular power struggles might be in a particular crisis, we can begin to understand existing tensions and take actions to diffuse them. Lucemore's second crisis management challenge is that during crises, communication is often connected to efficiency. That is, getting the right message to the right people at the right time. Lucemore argues that one of the critical challenges during crises is making sure that this actually happens. There's also a suggestion that communication during crises isn't necessarily about the niceties, it's often more functional. Yet from a relationship management perspective, while there are probably moments where we have to be a bit command and control in our communication style, crisis management doesn't mean that we can necessarily interact in ways that are problematic for long-term relationship management. This goes within the organization and externally to our stakeholders as well. So we can think of this as both an interpersonal as well as an organizational challenge during crises. Third, crises tend to encourage conflict. In this case, we're talking about conflict and crisis from a management perspective. So we're talking about conflicts within the organization. Research on organizational conflict identifies six primary sources of conflict within organizational settings. During crises, these conflict sources are likely amplified by the emotional intensity of the situation. This can cause organizational problems in managing the crises as these conflicts emerge because to manage the crisis, the conflict has to be managed. We can think of crises as inside out problems in the context of organizational management. Everything has to be working internally in order for the external crisis to be effectively handled. This is one of the reasons that we're going to spend some time focusing on effective teamwork in this series because crises are handled by teams and it's imperative that the, for effective crisis management that we have great teamwork. If problems exist for an organization or a team in terms of these kind of conflict factors, then those problems will certainly manifest during crisis. So from a crisis management perspective, it's to an organization's advantage to have very functional teams that they can rely on. Fourth, crises tend to discourage collective responsibility. We like someone to blame. Most people have a bit of a predisposition to minimize the perception that they're at fault. Sometimes there might be a cultural factor involved with face saving. Sometimes it's because we're afraid of facing consequences, but mostly there's a psychological reaction involved that we don't want to cause undue problems. We feel bad about that. So averting blame is some combination of manifestations of our own guilt about not wanting to have negative consequences, but this is problematic during crisis management because a lot of the times people are too worried about who's going to be held responsible that they don't focus on solving the problem. In a lot of cases, when we think about emotion and crisis, we're only really thinking about external stakeholders' experience. But managing emotions for internal stakeholders is just as challenging and vital as for those outside the organization. In his theory, Lusmore also identifies four factors that will help manage the challenges emerging from crises. The first is social adjustment. 
there's always going to be a period of social adjustment induced by a crisis and whatever new social order emerges that depends on the overlapping of interests within an organization balancing power between opposing interest groups the sensitivity of managerial interventions and the occurrence of whatever natural environmental events so to successfully manage a crisis organizations really have to create the conditions for social adjustment the assumption is that the organization and the people in it will change and that's just a reality especially the most serious of crises so this means that everyone in the organization as well as the stakeholders have to get used to the new reality once the crisis subsides but that is not a passive process the second component to good crisis management is coping with behavioral instability the management of unpredictable behavioral change is a key aspect in crisis management because crises have a destabilizing effect they create behavioral instability by creating the conditions that desensitize people to the needs of others and so it's easier for tensions to emerge this involves ensuring that people become or remain focused and not just focused on how the crisis of, is affecting them naturally this is most applicable to internal stakeholders but building a sense of community experience and identity with external stakeholders is actually one way that crises can be successfully managed if people are taken out of a crisis mentality their behaviors stabilize and things begin to work again but it also means that organizations have to be sources of stability even through a crisis Third, in managing crises, social structures also have to be managed. The issue of social structure is a key factor in the crisis management process because responses to a crisis influence reactions and efficiency. Social structures of organizations and communities can help influence reactions by determining the efficiency of information dissemination and the groups receiving the information. At the heart of invoking effective social structures for disseminating information is an organizational focus on the reduction of uncertainty. When uncertainty is managed, it reduces misunderstandings, disagreement, frustrations, tension, and ultimately conflict. In modern contexts, this can be achieved through a number of means from face-to-face -face and social media, but it's a matter of reaching audiences when they need information. Finally, Lusmore argues that to manage crises effectively, diametric opportunities have to be managed through a combination of what's happening outside the organization, inside the organization, and the nature of the crisis itself. Crises can create environments that can be both constructive and destructive to the crisis management efforts. In a destructive context, a crisis can induce managerial inertia by discouraging collective responsibility, teamwork, and effective communication at a time when they are of heightened importance. And that's what we've been talking about already with the challenges. But paradoxically, this inertia tends to draw an organization into this self-perpetuating cycle of escalation, which prolongs a crisis and absolutely wastes managerial resources. However, as well as providing opportunities for division and conflict, crises also provide opportunities for increased cohesion, harmony, and efficiency. So this too can become self-perpetuating, and that shortens the crisis and reduces the investment of managerial resources. Lusmore's theory of crisis management is one that's been cited in a lot of crisis research and practitioner work in the last couple of decades, but I think that one of the key elements that his identification of challenges and factors influencing successful crisis management demonstrates is that effective communication is likely to predict the success or failure of crisis response efforts. Internally, managing our teams and organizations relies on creating productive work environments, and externally, it takes the same as a way to focus people's identification with the organization and willingness to work through the situation collaboratively. It should be clear how crisis management is inherently intertwined with crisis communication and managing risk. Even if the people managing crises or communicating with critical stakeholders are different, 
Effective crisis management and communication rely heavily on teams, group decision making, staff development, simulation, and constant evaluation. Yet crisis communication is also distinctive because it focuses on stakeholder relationship management, narrating the crisis, and the development and implementation of communication strategy for crises. We'll be addressing all of this in detail. However, it's important to think about the development and implementation of crisis strategy or the public relations function in crisis communication as a campaign. What we do in crisis communication broadly follows the same form and function as any other strategic communication campaign, but with a crisis plan and crisis response at the heart of the campaign's purpose.